Okay, well, thanks for coming and bearing the possible snowstorm that might be coming here. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. Thanks for coming in today. Um, just start out with some introductions. Um, myself, Dave Rhinus, I'm the VP of Technology at Object Partners. Um, been working in the industry for 18 years, 16 of those years at Object Partners. Um, and nine years of my experience has been at uh, a couple different telematics companies. So my focus personally has been around development, architecture, technology leadership. So I kind of do all of those things in my day-to-day -day activities. Um, mainly focused around cloud services, distributed system, microservices, data stores, and messaging systems. So my background is more on the server side cloud infrastructure around these pieces, not on the various IoT devices. Um, Object Partners, Partners is uh, focused on building and delivering custom software solutions to our clients. We've been around since 1996. We have around 100 full-time consultants, offices in Minneapolis, Omaha, Chicago, and clients nationwide. We do mainly remote engagements for our nationwide clients and then um, on-site a lot of times at our local clients. Uh, the practice areas Object Partners focuses on, mainly JVM is where we grew up, but JavaScript is a real big practice area for us as well mobile and DevOps, real-time data solutions, um, and then also solution delivery is the other areas that we focus on here. IoT at Object Partners. So from a client perspective, we've had uh, several different telematics companies that we've worked in over the, the past several years. Um, we also work with a home automation company and a couple more that we can't talk about right now. Um, we also have uh, experience with a couple different cloud IoT platforms, so AWS IoT, which I'll talk about today, but also with the Exosite platform, which is another cloud-based managed solution out there um, that I'd encourage you to take a look at as well. Also, if you're interested in uh, some of the blogs at Object Partners, uh, we have several blogs on more of the device side on IoT, so uh, Igor Schultz, one of our uh, consultants here and several of our consultants actually kind of do this as a hobby, but he has some blogs on Mimo Light, Z-Wave, SSL for Home Assistant, Raspberry Pi, so if you're interested, uh, take a look at our blog and you'll find some more interesting IoT-based articles. So today we're here to talk though about AWS IoT. So AWS IoT is a managed platform for internet connected devices. It's gonna provide you with a fully managed service that's ready available, and that's probably one of the biggest advantages is it's ready now, right, for you to start up with. Sign up, get hooked up, and you're ready to go at massive scale. Uh, the scalability, they quote on their website, is uh, billions of devices and trillions of messages. So um, they're ready to scale at, at the need that you're gonna need. It's secure, we'll get into the security and how that works in a little bit here. Standard protocol support, device management services to help manage the state of the devices and simplified integrations into the rest of the AWS suite. Give you an idea of what we're gonna talk about today. First, we'll talk about creating a device on the platform. Then we'll get a little bit into the uh, AWS IoT broker, how that works, as well as the MQTT protocol. Uh, how to publish data via a device, capturing data in the cloud, consuming data via a device, managing device state, and then monitoring the entire system. So that's kind of what we'll walk through today. So creating the device. So one thing with the, the, the platform is, you'll notice they use the term device and thing interchangeably. So sometimes in the documentation, they'll say thing, and sometimes it'll say device. So I don't know, I, I tend to call it device, but thing is also a, a, a thing that they use, so. All right, so the first thing that you'd wanna evaluate when you're starting to talk about creating a thing is whether or not you want to set up a thing type. A thing type is, is something that's gonna give you searchable attributes. So if you have a device, you only are gonna have three custom attributes you can add. With a thing type, you can say, I wanna have up to 50 custom attributes uh, on your device and they're searchable. So within the UI, you can search for them and, and the APIs as well. It's mainly used to simplify the management. Um, it's not required. So if we go in, just to give you an idea here, if we go into the platform, 
to zoom in so you guys can all see that. So you notice I have one thing typed. So this is just the standard AWS console. I'm just in the IoT page here. So that's how you get to this page. Um, if you go to thing types, I have one thing type called sample device type. So if we click on that device type, you'll see it comes up over here. So I have a sample device type and it has two attributes that I've just randomly decided to use, manufacturer and serial number. Again, these are things that you could define however you want. Uh, once you define them, you can't change them. Um, and if I was gonna create a new thing type, you go to create thing type, my type whoop, description, and then you can just, as you can see, you can just add however many attributes you wanna add to that thing type. Okay, so that's thing types. Once you have your thing types, then it's just a matter of creating your thing or your device that you wanna to connect to the infrastructure. So again, the thing type and the custom attributes are not required, those are optional. But in this case, I have a sample device that I've decided to, to associate to the sample device type and as you can see, it has a manufacturer and a serial number associated with it. So when you create it of that type, so if you create a resource, create a thing, so my device, I can choose this type or no type, but if I choose this type and I got a, have a manufacturer and serial number, I can assign, and I can also add the custom attributes to that, um, to that device as well. So the next thing we're going to get into is the security a little bit. So each device, the security with the broker is set up through certificates. So what you can do is actually create and activate a certificate. So from, whoop, from AWS IoT console, this is a certificate that I already have set up, but you can actually go ahead and create a certificate um, right here. So the certificates are an X509 certificate, and then it'll also give you a private key that you can download um, as well. Now one important thing to note here is that you don't necessarily have to let AWS create your certificate. So if you wanna have a manufacturing process where you burn the private key and certificate right into the device, you can do that and that private key never needs to leave the device. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty secure mechanism for uh, authenticating that device. Once you have that certificate, you associate it to two things. So you'll associate it to a device and then a policy. So if I click, click on the certificate, so you can attach to a policy. You can, you can attach a number of policies to a certificate. I think it's like 10. And you can also attach it to a thing so that you have um, your device now is attached on the server side to that certificate so that when the device calls in with that certificate, um, it, it recognizes and authenticates that device. Creating a policy. So policies, if you're familiar with the AWS platform, are how you define your authorizations um, for AWS IoT. So for example, here's a, we'll get more into the definition of policies later. Uh, right now what I've done is I've just got this policy set up that says this is allowed to do basically anything on the IoT platform, which is not something you'd probably do in production, but it just makes the sample a little simpler to set up. So then you associate the certificate to the device and the policy and you're good to go. So, so that's pretty much it from setting up, getting your device onto the platform, setting up the certificate, the policy, and the most next thing. Any questions on that piece of setup? So I'm wondering, when you set up a certificate, so let's say there is a thousand of devices and 10 types, so 10 different kinds of devices. 
will you use one certificate for all, or do you need to use one certificate per device, or do you need one certificate per device type? So the certificate is set up for the device for the purposes of identifying that device. So when that device makes a connects to the broker, it becomes the identification of that particular device or thing. So that it knows what's going in. So, so you set up a certificate so for a device. So if it's a pretty big network and lots of devices, you, you gotta have a certain individual yeah. certificate for the yeah. Yeah. Okay, understanding the broker. Um, so the AWS IoT message broker is, has a couple capabilities. At its core, it's, a, it's an MQTT pub sub um, broker. Um, but it also supports other protocols. So it supports the MQTT over web sockets. Um, this is handy in some mobile applications and also in, um, uh, in, in like web-based applications, if you wanted to connect to the broker and either consume messages or publish messages. Um, it also supports HTTP. So you can have, if you have some backend services that you want to publish to the broker, you don't want those services have to deal with MQTT connections and that type of thing, you can simply publish to the broker over HTTP to have messages go down to the device. MQTT, um, this is the definition from Wikipedia of, of what MQTT is. Couple uh, keywords here, so it's a pub sub, so you got published subscribed semantics. Uh, it's a lightweight, and it's designed for remote locations, small code for footprint, and low network bandwidth. So all areas that are very, um, um, that, that work really well in that IoT type device where you might not have good networks or a, a large uh, availability for a large code footprint. So just talking through a little bit the MQTT concepts. Uh, so every client that connects to the MQTT broker has a client ID associated with it. So that client ID must be unique across the entire system. If you have two devices that try to connect with the same client ID, it's gonna kick the one that's connected off. Right, so only one client can connect. Um, and interestingly enough, this is a reason that you probably wouldn't wanna use MQTT on the server side is if you want to have multiple consumers consuming or multiple threads or multiple um, uh, service uh, servers consuming as from the same topic, uh, they, would have, they can't have the same client ID. Client publishes messages to a topic, so you publish to a specific topic, and then you can subscribe to messages based on topic filters. We'll go through an example of topics and topic filters here. So topics are divided into levels. So for example, you might have, if you did it based on your organizational structure, you might have ABC company, West Coast, and then message type, maybe a C message, and then the client ID generally, it's like the sample device, might be my client ID. So that's a topic, uh, but I also might have ABC company, East Coast, temperature message for another device. And then topic filters allow you to subscribe to those different topics. So I can say, I want to subscribe to, in the case of ABC Company West Speed Plus, topic filter matching all the West Coast speed messages. Okay, so it's one level is how that plus works. Um, you also have the, the number of pound sign, that wildcard denotes multiple levels. So if I have a topic filter matching all ABC company messages in all regions, east and west, then ABC company slash pound will give you that, okay? And then tap, again, you can, use the, you can use them anywhere within the levels. So topic filter matching all speed messages across both regions, ABC company slash plus slash speed slash plus. So that'll give you all the messages. So that's topics and topic filters. One other important concept with MQTT is QoS, or quality of service. So the MQTT specification supports three levels of quality of service. 
there's zero, which means at most once. So at most, as a subscriber, I'm gonna send you this to you once. Um, what that's useful for is really high throughput, less impact, but if I drop a message here or there, it's not gonna matter, right? QoS1 is say, I want you to guarantee that you're at least gonna send me this message once. Now I may send it to you more than one time, but I will guarantee that you're gonna get this message as a subscriber at least one time. Uh, QS2, exactly once, is actually not supported by the, the IoT broker, and it's very difficult to do in, in distributed systems. So um, generally QS0 and one are probably where you're uh, looking at, at utilizing when you're using MQTT. Another interesting feature of AWS IoT is the last will and or MQTT, and also supported by the IoT broker is last will and testament message. So this can help you detect, for example, when your device is continuously disconnected um, ungracefully from the network. So the MQTT protocol um, gives you a connect and disconnect kind of semantics. If that connection is cut ungracefully for some reason then the broker will raise a last will and testament message, which is just a message to a topic that you can define when you um, make that connection to the broker. So when I connect to the broker, I can say, as my last will and testament message, I want you to send this message to this topic with this body. So very helpful if you're trying to uh, understand if your devices, you know, as, as you said, millions of devices in the field, how do I know if I'm having problems? That's one way. Uh, to try to detect those things or to trigger some action based on what happened. Security we talked about a little bit, um, but all the connections are TLS encrypted with AWS IoT. Um, from an authentication standpoint, we talked about the X509 certificate. That can be used when you're using MQTT, and it can also be used when you're using the HTTPS protocol interaction with the broker. Um, when you're using HTTPS and WebSockets, you can use AWS IAM authentication as well. Um, and also AWS Cognito, which lets you integrate with your social logins and, and some, some of those mechanisms. And authorization we touched on a little bit, uh, it's all policy-based authorizations. So in terms of authori authorizations, <clears throat> there's different policy actions that can be specified. So you can specify different policies for the connect action, the publish action, the subscribe action, and the receive action. And I'll show examples of that here. So allowing a connect. So this is an AWS, or a portion of an AWS policy file. Um, as you can see, I'm a, the action that we're dealing with here is the IoT Connect action. So upon IoT Connect, the broker will check to see if the client ID is client slash sample device. Okay, so it's saying that device is allowed to connect, essentially. So that would prevent another device connecting with a different certificate, right? Allows subscribe, allows you to subscribe to a topic filter. So you can say, I want this policy set up so that I would subscribe to sample slash sample device topic filter. Allow receive is to a topic, so you can receive messages on this topic. And allow publish we're showing a policy variable here, but essentially it's saying, allow this to publish to ABC company West speed and then the client ID of the device that's connecting. So there's, there's a couple different policy variables, I won't go into them in detail, but that are available um, with the policy files in, in AWS IoT. Any questions on the policies? So, 
So the earlier question was that every device is going to have that sort of mood swing. Yeah. Then I think I heard you say you can only associate how many certificates can be associated with policy. So there, the certificate actually show that in the UI. Oops, that was the wrong button. All right, so if I look at a certificate here, your certificate is actually associated with the policy and the device. So you can add more than one policy to that certificate if you wanted to break them up. You wouldn't have to. You could probably do a form policy file if you wanted to. Um, so the certificate, again, is basically it's authentication. So it's like it's username and password. Is what the certificate. So where's the client ID? Yep, so the client ID is a MTTT principle. And it's part of the connection, and it just says this is my. It's just a you, you can generate it, it can be completely random, but it's probably not a good idea to have them use random client IDs because you might have conflicts between devices. So, you generally would assign probably the thing type or the thing name that you gave the, the device as the client ID just to keep it track of it. But, for example, let's say you have a maybe you have a serial number on your device, you might use that as your just so that you're guaranteed that I know that this is the device that's, that's calling me. Thanks. Does that help clear it up? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So just from an awareness perspective, there are some deviations from the MQTT spec that AWS IoT has. Um, if you're looking at using this broker, I would make sure you read through this. The link's right here. Um, but a couple important ones, QS2 we talked about, but another important one is clean session equals false. Um, I'll explain this here. So clean session means that, so when I, create, when I create my connection, you can specify whether you want the session to be clean, true, or false. If I say clean session false, what that means is I, I don't want you to get rid of any messages that I have subscribed. It's going to create this persistent session. So if I disconnect and come back on with clean session false, then those messages that were delivered to the broker while I was offline will be delivered to me. Okay. Unfortunately, that's not supported with AWS IoT. So if I'm offline, I send messages to the broker, I come back online, it's not gonna, not gonna be there for me. Okay. So there's a couple ways to deal with this. Um, one is a concept called device shadows, and I'm gonna get into device shadows in a little bit more detail, but essentially it's a state that you can set on the server that will always be replicated to the device so the device can keep that state. Um, we'll go through an example of that later. But if you're sending more like commands down the device, not particularly a certain state, but I want you to do this, then this, then this, and you need all of those things to be sent, um, then you might have to look at doing application level acknowledgements outside of the protocol. Um, so something where your actual application, assuming the code would acknowledge back to your server-side application to say, I got this message, so you don't have to resend it. Um, one way that you could potentially do this is hooking up with the lifecycle events. So a feature that they have on the broker is uh, the lifecycle events, particularly for connect and disconnect. So one way you can think about this is if a message is sent to a device on the broker before it's sent, you could you know, persist that message, right? And then if that device is online, it's just going to get thrown away. Um, but then when that device connects, there's lifecycle events on, that happen on the broker. I can say, oh, this device is connected, and I can take that data out of persistent storage, resend it to the device, wait for an acknowledgement, come back, and then mark the send on my side. So if, it's unfortunate, but there's some ways to deal with it. I think the device shadows will take care of most scenarios. It just really depends on what you're trying to do in terms of sending the messages. Are like you sending like configuration data or state data, or is it more of those individual commands that you need to send on the device? One important note on like, the command usage is nothing's guaranteed in order either. So when you send something to the broker, you can get it in, in, in your order. Keep that in mind. Okay, 
Any questions on the broker topics, client ID, subscriptions? It's, the MQTT spec is actually readable. It's, I mean, it's not something that, you know, you may want to read in your spare time, but it, it's something you could actually sit down and read and digest pretty easily. It's not too bad person to like, I think I tried looking at the AMQT spec one time and it was much, much broader. So, um, might be worth looking at if you're interested. All right, so publishing data via a device. So I'm on a device and I want to send some message to the broker. So there's a handful of device SDKs that are supported. Embedded C, JavaScript, Arduino, Java, Python, iOS, Android, for all the SDKs that are out there. Uh, one note on this is these are the AWS supported SDKs. They do a lot of simplification for you and to make it easier to connect to certificates and things like that. Um, you can also use other MQTT clients if you wish. Um, take a little bit more, and it, but it'll give you a little bit more fine-grained access to some of the things as well. Uh, Paho client is probably one of the most popular ones um, that's out there. Okay, so this, we can just get into a little code. So this is an example of I'll walk through the sample application here and kind of talk this through. So this is just a sample device. I just have a simple main application in, in Java. How many are familiar with Java here? A little bit? Okay, at least readable, hopefully. Um, so this device is created and then it's initialized. So what this code is doing here is the first thing it's doing is it's dealing with their certificate. So this certificate utils class is actually something that was recommended in the Amazon AWS IoT device SDK for Java. Um, they just said use something like this. This is where that code came from. So I didn't write any of this code, but they recommend just using this to deal with the certificates. Um, and then once you have that key store and key password, you can actually create the MQTT client. And here I'm just passing in the endpoint to that client. So what's the URL that the broker is located at and the client ID. So, and that's just something that I've passed in to the program and then the key store and the, a key password. So then you're gonna create a new uh, sample device so this is the shadow stuff I was talking about. We'll get into that a little bit later. And then, but otherwise it's just a matter of connecting. So you just connect to that broker at that point. So that's making that connection to the MQTT broker. And then publishing, I have a publisher set up here. And this is just a Java runnable. So it runs on a thread. Uh, but basically what this publisher is going to do is it's going to determine a random speed and if that speed is greater than a configured minimum speed, then it's going to publish this JSON payload with the actual speed in it via this publish method. So it's going to tell the client that we just created to publish to the speed topic. You give it your QoS level. So in this case I'm saying I want it guaranteed to be sent to the server and then the payload. So pretty simple and straightforward. And again, all these libraries for the different languages and SDKs are, are, are different in the nature of the handle just because of the nature of the difference in the languages, but pretty straightforward. Any questions on publishing data? Okay. Yep. So Installs, right? So you have to be able to aggregate the data in some manner. 
So it follows the same, the usual AWS build. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So captioning data on the server side. <clears throat> so this is some of the most powerful stuff that's available uh, from AWS IoT too, is being, not only be able to serve, uh, to scale your, your servers, your, your, your connections to the devices, to millions of devices, but then what do I do with that data once I handle ha have it on the server side? How do I collect those trillions of messages or whatever it might be, or millions of messages on, my, on the server side? So they have something called uh, a rules engine that's set up on the server side. And what it does is it gives you a SQL-like syntax for selecting the message, and then you can basically perform various actions with that data once you have it. So here's, an, here's a very simple example of selecting a message. So from the speed example, select star from the topic speed slash plus. So that's any speed messages that are coming across. Um, no, this doesn't have the whole region or company in the region that had my other examples. The topic literally is just speed slash simple choice. Select star from speed plus where speed is greater than 55. Now I've got any messages coming in where my speed is, is considered speeding. And then what I can do with that message is I can send it to the various Amazon products. So I can send it to Elasticsearch, and it's immediately searchable and indexed right there. Uh, I can send it to Firehose, so Firehose can push stuff to uh, Redshift or to S3. Uh, Kinesis for my kind of streaming analytics capabilities. I can have it invoke a Lambda function. I can send it to SQS. I can send it to S3, uh, DynamoDB. I can also republish the message. So I could say I want to republish it to something else based on some kind of logic, like a new speeding topic or something. Um, I can integrate with CloudWatch or SNS as well. So it's, it's really well integrated into the entire Amazon ecosystem. So just as a demo here, let's see. We go to AWS IoT. And let's close this. Rules. So here's my speeding rule. You can just see here. Select star from speed, just like I had. And then I'm just going to send it to an SQS queue because that's easy to demo when it comes in. So if I go to my sample application, and I'm just going to run that application, passing in the certificate, the client ID, and the endpoint that I'm talking to. This is just every second. If the speed's greater than that minimum speed of 20, it's going to send it up to the broker. So here's some, and we've got one that's greater than 55 here. So we should be able to go here. Services SQS. And I've got a speeding queue. You can see I've got five messages in and then the number of messages available is incrementing. And I can actually see the new messages coming in. So here's the messages that were over 55 miles an hour coming in to that queue. So this is a really handy way to integrate with Say you want to integrate with a third party or another system, really simple to do with, with these rule, this rule setup. I'll also show the console here has the ability to subscribe to a topic. So from this browser, I can generate a client ID out of random, random client ID, and then I can connect to the broker and I can subscribe to a topic. So I want to subscribe to speed slash plus. Subscribe. And I can see the new messages coming in right here within the console too. So that's handy for debugging and things like that as, as messages are coming through.
Okay. Any questions on the rules engine? Consuming data via device. So if we go back to here. In my sample device initialization here, you'll notice down here I created a new sample consumer and told it to subscribe. So this is the sample consumer code. Um, it's being passed in the, the MQTT client and has a single subscribe method. In order to subscribe in Java, there's a helper class called AWS IoT Topic. And I'm just overriding the on message, right? And then it's just gonna log a message when it's sent to it. And then finally I say, okay, I want you to subscribe to this topic. That's how it's set up. When I created that AWS IoT topic, I passed in the topic filter that I wanted. So I'm subscribing to sample slash whatever my client ID is. And the QoS level I want is QoS one. So when I go to Still running, and I can connect again. And this has a utility for publish that message, and then I see it come across right away. So it's an example of being able to publish, and it has some tools for you to be able to. One note on this subscriber. If you'll notice this on message here, um, acknowledge, acknowledgements within the AWS IoT topic, um, as soon as it receives that message, it's essentially acknowledged from what I can gather. I can't find anything in the documentation that appears that way, that that's the way it is. So if I throw an exception from this message, it doesn't appear that it's gonna resend that to me from what I can gather. Um, one way to deal with that is to deal with, uh, use the Pavel client instead of the, the AWS IoT. Um, probably talk to the AWS IoT guys too and see if there's something else that, that's available to handle that. But with the Pavel client, within the message arrived on a topic, you can actually, if an exception is thrown, it, it, will, it will not acknowledge it back and it should be re-delivered to you again. So. Just something to keep in mind as you're dealing with these, these messaging systems. It may not be important to you. If you're at a QoS zero and you throw an exception, you may not care. So. Okay. Device state management. So I talked about this a little bit later, the concept of device shadows. So the shadows provide you a, a mechanism for dealing with device state. For example, we have the minimum speed set on the configuration of the device in the demo. Um, you, there's a JSON document that you can set up that's associated with the device that will provide server-side configuration and then synchronization with that device. So in this example, I want my minimum speed set to 20 and the reported speed that I'm getting, the reported speed is desired and reported. Reported is what the device has reported back. I'll show an example here and how that works. So I'm gonna go back to my sample device here. And I'm actually gonna shut this down right now. So here you can see that my shadow device has that desired minimum speed of 20 and reported minimum speed of 20. So I can actually go say, you know, I'm sending way too much data up to the server. I only want messages greater than 50. I can update my shadow and you'll see now that it says out of sync. So my device is not in sync with um, what the device shadow is on the server side. And I can see the desired is 50, reported from the device is still 20, and the difference is this min speed 50. Now, if I go back and start my application,
you can see now that it's got this min speed of 50. And we go back here and refresh and it's reported back 50. And then if I want to go back, change it to 20, update the shadow. I can see here the 20 has automatically come down and now I'm using that minimum speed of 20 value when publishing messages. And if I refresh here, it's in sync automatically. So that's the concept of the device shadow. And you can see why that'd be important um, for keeping configuration or state data that you might want in sync with the device. Um, so how's all this working? So behind the scenes, there's a concept of shadow topics. So you'll notice the topics start with dollar sign AWS. So that means they're AWS system um, topics. So you can't actually create uh, those topics yourself. And things, thing name, shadow. So things, thing name, shadow update. If you want to update the device shadow from the device, you can call that update topic. And then once that update is accepted, it'll publish another message back to the accepted. If it's rejected, it'll publish back to the rejected. rejected. The documents gives you previous and current state of things as it comes across. And the deltas show the change, document, the, the change that was there. Now when you start up, you might want to publish a message to Git. So if you publish the Git topic, it'll say, I want to get the device shadow. It'll publish another message back to the Git accepted, Git rejected if it's rejected for some reason, from which you can get your configuration. And then delete allows you to delete device shadows. So trying to deal with all that in your code is not simple. It's eventually trying to synchronize on all these different topics and different threads and everything coming back. It can get kind of difficult to have all that synchronization happen appropriately. So within the Java class, and I think within some of the other SDKs, there's a helper that makes this really, really simple. So this device helper class, you just extend the AWS IoT device, and then you put an annotation on there, AWS IoT device property, min speed, and then you just give it git and set min speed. And that's how that, and then it, it'll take care of all the topics and listening and everything for you. Um, now one thing with that, you would have to actually ask for the min speed. So if you want to be updated of when it actually changes, um, in that class, you can actually override this on shadow update. So I'm doing in the code here and then I'm just, and then you get the JSON state, but then I'm just calling this shadow update listener, which is actually a method on my sample device saying, Hey, there was an update to this thing. And then it can just go get the, the value off and then speed. So how this is working on our site on shadow update, this sample device, Uh, so it's just calling here when I created it on shadow update and what it's doing it says is there already a, a publisher task running if so cancel it get the new minimum speed from the sam sample shadow device and then schedule another executor with a fixed delay of one second with the new minimum speed so that's how that's all happening behind the scenes There are also policies that you need to attach for device shadows. So whether controlling your access to deleting, updating, and getting things shadow data. So that's all controlled through that same policy file. So there's different policy actions that you can define. Any questions on the device shadows? Support, can I paraphrase my understanding? Yeah. After that, right? yeah. So if I want to implement a device, I could um, implement a class like you could show there that registered its in its own shadow. So and then the classes you use would cause the device state and the shadow state to be automatically uh, synchronized without you having to do anything really special on the device right. to be managing on that. Right. It creates a nice library for you. To not have to say, I'm going to subscribe to this topic, and then I'm going to yeah, all the little things. Yeah, you do. I actually tried implementing it that way. I was going to show that, but it would have just got way too fast <laughs> to do. So, okay. um, yeah. 
makes it really simple. But if you're dealing with like the Paho client per se, then that would be something that you would have to do if you want to use shadow functionality is all that topic management and things yourself. Because you're not using it. Yeah, those are AWS, in which you may want to be broker agnostic, right? You may not want your devices to be you know, tied to a particular broker. Um, so that, that might be another option to use Pavo versus the AWS piece. Okay, monitoring the system. So, of course, AWS CloudWatch is used to monitor the system. There's metrics, alarms, logs, and events to, that you can use. Uh, so I'll just kind of show some of those now. So if I go to AWS, CloudWatch, I have a dashboard set up here. And this just illustrates some of the, the metrics that you can get out of the broker. So publish in, publish out success. So how many messages were published? You can see it was doing one per second. So you can see that coming across. How many connects and subscribes I got? Uh, shadows, so get thing, get updates of the thing shadow and whether they accept it or not. And then rules executed. So on the back end, what, how many times was a rule executed on the back end? So this can give you a good feeling for kind of the overall health of your system um, through the dashboard capabilities. There's also logs that you can enable. I currently have the trace level log enabled. So you're literally going to see a lot of interaction here. Um, Here's a, here's a message from the rules engine saying the message does not satisfy the where clause. Um, this is a publish in success, right? So you get really you can get really fine grained trace level details of what's happening with your system. So that's pretty handy to have. That's about all I have. Um, here's some resources that you can look at if you're interested. Um, the first resource there, I'll send these out, um, is the AWS IoT sample project that I put together. So that's out on public GitHub repo. MQQT documentation, um, the developer guide. The other thing, if you want to start using AWS IoT, start thinking about what the limits are. Um, there's some limits you want to talk about as far as like message size and things like that you want to review. Um, pricing, of course, is good to look at before you start using it, um, but it's pretty uh, pretty reasonable for the infrastructure that you're going to get. I think it's like five dollars per million messages or something like that. But take a look and understand your pricing model before you start using it um, extensively. Um, and then AWS Labs also has AWS IoT examples with the different SDKs. So if you're not using Java, if you're using JavaScript or Arduino or something, there's examples out there on their website or some of the other SDKs. Okay, that's it. Any other questions? So we're in your screens now. Do you want um, it to be lagging in some regard? Or do you just have to push more there? Yeah, the biggest frustration was the clean session calls. Because we want to be able to send messages to the broker and not have to build in application level acknowledgements. Um, in our case, we weren't dealing, dealing with just device state. We wanted other things to be sent there no matter what. So it was, that was the biggest frustration. But you know, there's ways to deal with it, I guess, with by shadow or application level. It's pretty instantaneous um, when it comes across. Um, we did some pretty extensive load testing on the system and we had a good performance profile to be able to handle it. It's just coming in and across. So, especially at QS0, it's lightning fast. How, how 
one of those keywords here? Or is it you're getting a lot of drops over there? Um, we didn't measure that. This is a while back too. So I'm afraid to quote anything because it's been so long. Yeah. So, but yeah, I don't, I don't know that you know it's done. How is the stability um, in terms of, for example, a thousand pieces and uh, there is no, no requests happening for a certain so similar to the website, okay? Yeah. Uh, the website is announcing views of hundred thousand people. Yeah. So how does Amazon know that if all of the devices start sending requests to receive requests at the same time? Yeah. So uh, we haven't tested that completely on this AWS IoT platform. So the testing we did was on the platform that preceded AWS IoT, which is the form that we made was a telemetry and we got bought up by the other side of town. So I just said to ask and answer a lot of those scalability questions without having to have actually done it myself. Um, but I didn't see anything on the previous, there was nothing we hit me then. We would start a blood test, we would hit it. Another question I had, it's not really related to what you were. Uh, explain, but you mentioned it in, in the beginning that there's another platform called Exosign. Yeah. Could you tell just like, very quick overview of that? Yeah, so compared to Amazon, how big is it? Yeah. So Exosign is actually a, a, a local company here in Minneapolis that has a platform that's available. Um, I personally have not done a lot of work with it. We have other consultants that have, so that would be able to speak to it in more detail. I know that their interfaces were built via HTTP, a lot of them. They also support something called OAP, some of the testing, so the constrained application protocol, which is a different semantics than, um, than MPTT. It's more of a, a request response, but, but it's over UDP actually. Um, and so that OAP protocol actually ties pretty nicely to the rest of your bases. So you can actually proxy things to REST interfaces over the UDP. So you send like getting the data to this REST interface and have it back. All the all the communication on the UDP. I've only played with that a little bit. That's something that they offer as well. Won't be either UDP or local standard UDP. Not sure. Yeah. Um, um, and I know that they recently announced some new communities as well. So they've got some new products that are out. Server side, but I can I can help you with contacts too on that. You know. um, yeah, I have a couple of questions. <clears throat> Recently, there was that uh, DDoS attack that was kind of spurred by IoT devices. Yeah. So one, did you experience any issues when that is occurring? What your project is, and two, how do you feel? How um, secure do you think these things are? Were they vulnerable to that sort of attack or were they pretty for security screen? Okay. I'm not super, I'm not super going to understand how that attack occurred, but I believe it was going out to devices and making requests elsewhere. Yep. So I don't know that this would actually protect. It would probably, because um, if they're able to get onto that device, it wouldn't be. I'm not a device security expert at all, so um, you know, from in terms of contacting the broker and the security around that, and you would have to compromise that device in order to get to the broker, which sounds like they actually get the device. So that's my non-answer. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I'm a server side person, so I don't know. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.